If you open an app called Electricity Maps on your phone right now, you will see a visual representation of a continent divided by an invisible wall. It is a map of real-time carbon emissions in Europe. On the left side of the Rhine River, the map is almost always a deep, calming green. This is France. Its carbon intensity, the amount of CO2 emitted to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity, hovers regularly around 20 to 50 grams. It is one of the cleanest industrialized economies on Earth. But as your eye crosses the border into Germany, the color shifts violently. The map turns brown, sometimes even black. In the industrial heartland of Europe, the carbon intensity spikes to 400, 500, or even 600 grams, Despite spending 20 years and hundreds of billions of euros on a project explicitly designed to save the planet, Germany is currently polluting nearly 10 times more per unit of electricity than its neighbor. This stark visual contrast is the result of the energy war, a decades-long strategic divergence that has defined the economic fate of Europe. And in 2025, the winner of this war is no longer in doubt. France is winning, Germany is losing. And the reasons why have nothing to do with climate change and everything to do with national security and hard physics. To understand how two neighbors with similar populations and GDPs ended up on different planets, we have to go back to 1973. The world was in the grip of the first oil crisis. The Arab oil embargo had quadrupled the price of crude overnight. For the United States, this was a recession. For Europe, it was an existential threat. Both France and Germany relied heavily on imported oil to burn in their power plants. Both countries realized simultaneously that they were dangerously exposed to the whims of foreign powers but their reactions to this trauma were diametrically opposed. In Paris, the Prime Minister, Pierre Mesmer, went on national television and delivered a line that would become the motto of the Fifth Republic. In France, we do not have oil, but we have ideas. He announced the Mesmer Plan. It was the most ambitious infrastructure project in the history of the Western world. France decided, unilaterally and without a public referendum, to electrify its entire economy using nuclear power. The French logic was cold and gaullist, if we cannot control the oil wells in Saudi Arabia, we must build energy sources that require no fuel we cannot secure. A nuclear pellet is tiny. You can store 10 years worth of fuel in a single warehouse. It creates energy sovereignty. They didn't just build a few reactors, they built an entire fleet. They standardized the design, the CP1 and P4 models, so that a technician from a plant in Normandy could walk into a plant in Lyon and know exactly where every bolt was. They built 56 reactors in 15 years. It was a feat of industrial velocity that has never been matched since. By the 1990s, France had decarbonized its grid almost by accident. They didn't do it to save the polar bears. They did it to save the franc. Across the Rhine, Germany drew a completely different conclusion from the 1970s. While France was embracing the atom, Germany was birthing the modern green movement. The anti-nuclear sentiment in Germany wasn't just about safety. It was deeply cultural, tied to the Cold War angst of being the potential battleground for a nuclear exchange between the U.S. and the USSR. The Green Party, Die Grünen, rose to power with a singular, non-negotiable demand. Adam Kraft, Nein Danke, nuclear power, no thanks. For decades, this was a political slogan. But in 2011, following the Fukushima disaster in Japan, Chancellor Angela Merkel turned it into law. She announced the Atomostieg, the complete phase-out of nuclear power. At the time, German engineers warned that this was suicide. You cannot turn off your nuclear plants, which provide steady, baseload power, and your coal plants, which are dirty, at the same time, while trying to run an industrial superpower on wind and solar alone. Wind and solar are intermittent. The sun doesn't shine at night. The wind doesn't blow on calm days. You need a backup. Germany's solution to this physics problem was the bridge theory. They believed they could use cheap Russian natural gas as a bridge to the future. They would build massive pipelines. Nord Stream 1 and 2 to import unlimited gas from Siberia. This gas would burn in power plants when the wind stopped blowing. It was cleaner than coal and cheaper than nuclear, or so they thought. Germany bet its entire industrial model on two assumptions. One, Russian gas would always be cheap and available. Two, the world would follow Germany's lead and buy German wind turbines and solar panels. France bet on the idea that energy independence was the only thing that mattered. For 10 years, Germany looked like the genius. They were the green superpower. Their economy boomed on cheap Russian gas. They lectured France on the obsolescence of nuclear power. They shut down fully functional paid off nuclear reactors that were among the safest in the world. Then came February 24th, 2022. Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine. The Nord Stream pipelines were sabotaged. The bridge collapsed. Germany woke up to a nightmare scenario. They had dismantled their nuclear fleet. Their renewable energy, the Energiewende, was producing only about 40-50% of their needs. It was useless on calm, cloudy days. And their gas supply was gone. 
France, meanwhile, had its own problems in 2022, the famous corrosion issues that temporarily took reactors offline, but the structure of their system remained intact. They didn't need Putin's gas to keep the lights on. They just needed to fix some pipes. The divergence in 2024 and 2025 has been brutal. France's nuclear fleet roared back to life. In 2024, France broke export records, sending 89 terawatt hours of electricity to its neighbors. They became the battery of Europe. On many days, the electricity flowing into German homes was actually generated by French nuclear reactors. Germany, desperate to keep its factories running without Russian gas, had to do the unthinkable. They reopened the coal mines. They began burning lignite, brown coal, the dirtiest, wettest, most carbon-intensive fuel on the planet. They literally dug up villages to expand coal pits, all while claiming to be the leaders of the climate transition. The green country was forced to brown its skies to survive, while the nuclear country enjoyed some of the cheapest, cleanest power in the world. The visual on the map, green France versus brown Germany, is not just a difference in technology. It is the difference between a country that planned for a hostile world, France, and a country that planned for a fantasy world, Germany. But the consequences of this war are not just about CO2, they are about money. Energy is the master resource, it is the input for everything else. If your energy is expensive, your steel is expensive, your chemicals are expensive, and your cars are expensive. In the next section, we will look at the economic slaughter happening in the German industrial heartland. We will explain why companies like BASF are packing up their factories and moving to China, and why the energy vendor might go down in history as the most expensive mistake a modern nation has ever made. If you walk through the industrial zones of the Ruhr Valley today, you will notice something terrifying. It isn't the noise of machinery, it is the silence. For 70 years, the sound of Germany was the hum of turbines, the clanking of steel mills, and the roar of chemical crackers. This was the engine of Europe. But in 2025, the engine is stalling. Germany is currently experiencing a phenomenon that economists call deindustrialization. This is not a cyclical recession. It is a structural amputation. Major companies are not just cutting costs. They are closing factories that have stood since the 19th century and moving them to the United States or China. And the reason is simple arithmetic. Energy is the master resource. If you make steel, aluminum, glass, or fertilizer, energy is not just a line item on your spreadsheet. It is 40% of your cost base. If your energy costs three times more than your competitors in Texas or Shanghai, you do not innovate, you die. To understand why German electricity is so expensive even though they spent billions on free wind and solar, you have to understand a pricing mechanism called the merit order. The European electricity market works on a pay-as-clear system. Imagine an auction. The cheapest sources, wind and solar, bid first because their fuel is free. Then comes nuclear, then comes coal. But the final price of electricity for everyone is set by the last power plant needed to meet demand. On a calm, cloudy day in Germany, the dreaded Dunkelflot, dark doldrums, the wind turbines are still. To keep the lights on, the grid operator has to turn on a gas-fired power plant. Because natural gas is expensive, especially LNG imported from America to replace Russian pipelines, that expensive gas plant sets the price for the entire market. This means that even if 40% of the grid is green, the industry pays the price of gas. France does not have this problem to the same degree. Because their nuclear fleet covers the base load, they rarely need to turn on the expensive gas plants. Furthermore, the French government forces its state-owned utility, EDF, to sell electricity to French factories at a regulated below-market price. This mechanism, known as REN, uh, Accès Régulé à l'Energie Nucléaire Historique, acts as a shield. While a German aluminum smelter is exposed to the volatility of the gas market, a French smelter has a guaranteed contract at $42 per megawatt hour. This is not a fair market. It is state-sponsored industrial warfare, and France is winning. The most painful symbol of this defeat is BASF. BASF is the largest chemical company in the world. Its headquarters in Ludwigshafen is not just a factory, it is a city. It consumes as much electricity as all of Denmark. For a century, Ludwigshafen was the beating heart of German industry. But in 2024, BASF announced it was permanently downsizing the site. They shut down ammonia plants and fertilizer lines because they were no longer profitable. At the same time, they announced a $10 billion investment to build a new state-of-the-art Verbund site in Zhangjiang, China. The CEO was blunt, Europe is becoming uninvestable. When the company that invented the Haber-Bosch process, which feeds half the world, decides that it can no longer produce fertilizer in its home country, the industrial model is broken. Germany is effectively exporting its CO2 emissions to China along with its jobs. The factory in China will run on coal-heavy Chinese grid power likely polluting more globally than the German plant did. But on the German ledger, emissions will go down, 
The politicians will celebrate hitting their climate targets, but they will have achieved it not by greening the economy, but by killing the economy. This brings us to the staggering cost of the energy venda. Since the year 2000, Germany has spent an estimated $500 billion to $600 billion on the energy transition. That is enough money to buy Apple, or to rebuild the entire infrastructure of Ukraine, or to build 50 new nuclear reactors. What did they get for this half trillion euro investment? They got an electricity grid that is twice as dirty as France is, and twice as expensive as the United States. They have installed more wind and solar capacity per capita than almost anyone else, but because of the low capacity factor, the sun doesn't always shine, they still have to maintain a full fleet of coal and gas plants as backup. They are paying for two distinct energy systems to do the job of one. France, by contrast, spent its money in the 1970s and 80s. Their reactors are paid off, their capital costs are amortized. They are now reaping the dividends of decisions made by engineers 50 years ago, while Germany pays the price for decisions made by ideologues 10 years ago. In the final section, we will look at the political fallout. The economic pain is fueling the rise of the AFD, alternative for Germany in the east, where the coal mines are closing. We will ask, can Germany reverse course? Is it too late to turn the nuclear plants back on? And we will explore the hydrogen fantasy, Germany's last ditch attempt to save its industry using a fuel that barely exists. If the economic cost of the energy war is measured in euros and lost factories, the political cost is measured in rage. For decades, Germany was the most stable democracy in Europe. It was a country of centrism, consensus, and boring coalitions. But the deindustrialization of the Ruhr in the East has shattered that consensus. The energy crisis has acted as an accelerant for the most significant political realignment since the fall of the Berlin Wall. The primary beneficiary of this chaos is the alternative for Germany, AFD. Once a fringe party focused on Euroscepticism, the AFD has mutated into a party of the left behind. The blue-collar workers who see their jobs migrating to China because the electricity bill is too high. In the former East Germany, where the coal mines are closing and the promise of a green jobs miracle has failed to materialize, the AFD is polling at levels that make it a kingmaker. They are campaigning on a platform that is effectively a rejection of the entire post-2011 energy consensus. Turn the nuclear plants back on, buy Russian gas, and stop the green madness. The political center, the coalition of social democrats, greens, and liberals, is collapsing under the weight of its own contradictions. They are trapped in a reality sandwich. On one side, they have the green ideology that forbids nuclear power and demands a rapid exit from coal. On the other side, they have the hard physics of the electricity grid which demands reliable baseload power. In the middle is the German voter, who is seeing their real wages evaporate as inflation, driven by energy costs, eats their paycheck. The result is a paralyzed government that cannot move forward because the green wing refuses to compromise on ideology and cannot move backward because admitting the nuclear phase out was a mistake would be political suicide. Desperate for a solution that doesn't involve admitting defeat, the German government has bet everything on a new savior. It is not a new reactor or a new pipeline, but a molecule, hydrogen. Walk into any government ministry in Berlin and you will hear the same word repeated like a mantra, Wasserstoff. The official plan is the hydrogen economy. The idea is that Germany will build massive wind farms in the North Sea to produce full green hydrogen via electrolysis or import it from sunny places like Namibia and Saudi Arabia. This hydrogen will then be burned in power plants to generate electricity when the wind isn't blowing and used in steel mills to replace coal. It sounds perfect. It is clean. It is futuristic. It saves the industrial base. There is just one problem, the thermodynamics. Hydrogen is not an energy source. It is an energy carrier. You have to make it. And making it is incredibly inefficient. To make green hydrogen, you take electricity, run it through water to split the H2 from the O, compress the gas to 700 bar, or liquefy it at 253 degrees, transport it halfway around the world, and then burn it in a turbine. At every step of this process, you lose energy. By the time the electron reaches the German steel mill, you have lost roughly 60% to 70% of the energy you started with. This is the round-trip efficiency problem. It means that to replace one unit of imported Russian gas, you need to generate three to four units of renewable electricity. Germany would need to cover an area larger than the entire country with wind turbines just to produce enough hydrogen to run its current industry. That is physically impossible. So the plan relies on imports. Germany is currently traveling the world, signing memorandums of understanding with countries like Canada, Chile, and Australia, promising to buy their future hydrogen. But the cost of this imported hydrogen will be astronomical, likely four to five times the cost of the natural gas it is replacing. 
You cannot run a competitive chemical industry on fuel that costs five times more than what your competitors in the US or China are paying. The hydrogen fantasy is a delay tactic. It allows politicians to pretend there's a plan to save the industry without having to make the hard choices today. It is hopium for a dying industrial model. This leaves Germany in a tragic geopolitical position. France has won the argument. President Macron has announced a nuclear renaissance, planning six to 14 new EPR reactors. Other European nations, Poland, Sweden, the Netherlands, are following the French lead, not the German one. They are signing contracts with Westinghouse, US, or EDF, France, to build new nuclear fleets. Germany is increasingly isolated, an island of energy instability in a nuclearizing Europe. The German model, cheap Russian gas plus high-tech exports, is dead. What replaces it? The likely future is a Swissification of the German economy. The heavy industry, the aluminum smelters, the fertilizer plants, the bulk steel will leave. They will go to the US, cheap shale gas, or China, cheap coal. Germany will be left with the high-end, low-energy sectors, software, specialized machinery, pharmaceuticals, and luxury cars. It will still be a rich country, but it will be a smaller economy with fewer blue-collar jobs and a more unequal society. The Made in Germany stamp, which once meant forged in the fires of the Ruhr, will increasingly mean designed in Berlin, manufactured in Guangzhou. Meanwhile, France will solidify its position as the energy hegemon of Western Europe. With its nuclear fleet refurbished and new reactors coming online in the 2030s, France will attract the energy-intensive industries that flee Germany. We are already seeing this. Battery gigafactories are choosing northern France, which calls itself Battery Valley, over Germany because the electricity is cleaner and cheaper. The irony is supreme. Germany spent 20 years trying to lead the world into the future, but by ignoring the laws of physics and the realities of geopolitics, it has engineered its own decline. It turns out that in the energy war, ideology is a poor shield against reality. The winner is the country that respected the atom, and the loser is the country that feared it. Serious direct to camera. We've discussed how governments can destroy their own economies through bad energy policy and ideological blindness. But the most dangerous thing a government can do isn't destroying an industry, it's seizing the wealth that remains. When a state runs out of options, when the debt is too high and the industry is gone, they stop following the rules. They rewrite them. In 1933, the United States government found itself in a trap. They couldn't print enough money because of the gold standard, so Franklin D. Roosevelt didn't negotiate. He signed Executive Order 6102. He criminalized the ownership of the one asset that protected people from the government's mistakes, gold. He forced every American to hand over their wealth under threat of prison. In the next video, we are going to tell the full, uncensored story of the great gold seizure. We will uncover the secret prosecutions, the legal loopholes the wealthy used to escape, and the terrifying legal precedent that allows the president to seize your Bitcoin, gold, and 401k during a national emergency today. You need to know if your safe is actually safe. Smash that like button to keep the signal alive, and subscribe so you don't miss the history of the gold ban. I'll see you in the vault.